But wonder of wonders, <clears throat> seven years later, we discovered what he had told the president. We discovered it in the Pentagon Papers, published first by the New York Times and then the Post. And what he told President Johnson was exactly the opposite. The war was going to hell in a handbasket, he said. General Westmoreland was going to ask for a couple of hundred thousand more troops, which he got, and that he, McNamara, would probably support that request. Just think for a minute how history might have changed if all Americans had known that their leaders at that time felt the war was going to hell in a handbasket. In the next seven years, thousands of American lives and more thousands of Asian lives would have been saved. The country might never have lost faith in its leaders because the country deep down, our country, deep down in their hearts, has come to know their leaders were lying. And that's the beginning, I think, of a great sea change in this country. The people knew it, despite whatever their commanders in chief said, they knew it. There wasn't much anybody could do about it, but they knew it. And America did start to lose faith in its leaders. All that information is hidden, really, in the Pentagon Papers. 43 volumes, if anybody ever wonders why newspapers raise such hell about being denied the right to print that information. The, the idea that any of it was secret boggles your mind, even if Nixon took to both papers to the Supreme Court. 18 years after it, you don't remember that, but 18 years, that's a long time after it. The prosecutor who, the, who was Solicitor General of the United States a man called Irwin Griswold, who was dean of the Harvard Law School, wrote a story for the Post saying that at no time, no time, had national security been threatened as a result of publishing the Pentagon Papers. No time. Let me, let me uh, just uh, take a little riff on this because it's so outrageous. It's, it's a, it was a civil case. And if you are, lose a civil case, you know damn well that you're going to be indicted for criminal, uh, some crime of, of criminal obstruction. A felon can't own a television station, as, uh, as people kept reminding Catherine Graham. But the high moment for me was when the judge, Gary Gassell, turned to an assistant secretary who, of defense who was testifying against the post. I think he was. Uh, he was in the uh, car business in uh, Nebraska somewhere before he became an expert on defense matters. <laughs> what information contained in the Pentagon Papers would most seriously damage the national security of the United States if the Washington Post publishes it, he asked. The guy went ashen white because, of course, he had not read the Pentagon Papers. Uh, not to put too fine of a point on it, neither had we read all of them, but, <laughs> but we had read a whole lot of them. Uh, he immediately asked for continuation for a few minutes, and we could see them all huddling over there. At, at the defense table, which had nine of us, uh, mostly reporters plus K, our chairman and chief owner, we had brought a couple of documents and we thumbed them nervously, but we waited and waited and waited. And when he came back, he, the stenotypist read the question back to him, and there was a hush, a pause, while he said, Operation Marigold. Well, that scared the bejesus out of me, if you want to know it. <laughs> because if it begins with operation, it's got to be top secret. <laughs> so George Wilson, our Pentagon correspondent started flicking through some transcripts of the hearings, not classified hearings, and in the agate prints which he loved so dearly and which all good uh, Washington Post reporters love, especially Walter Pincus, uh, he found a reference to Operation Marigold, quite a specific one. In case you've forgotten what it was, it was an effort by Lyndon Johnson to enlist the Poles, Canadians, and Indians to see if Ho Chi Minh would offer them a deal that he wouldn't uh, offer him, uh, Johnson. And believe it or not, the following weeks, Life magazine had a lead article by Harold Wilson, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, and the title of that article was Operation Marigold. I mean, it was just was and is ridiculous. I don't mean to suggest that presidents before LBJ didn't lie. They did. 
but try as I can, their lies seem less momentous and less habitual. Kennedy didn't lie about women, probably because no woman ever accused him of whatever form of sexual harassment or even involvement. Surely Kennedy did lie about having Addison's disease. He had it, and he said he didn't have it. The explanation for that lie must itself lie in the description of the disease, a disease caused by failure of the adrenal glands, character characterized by weakness, low blood pressure, and brownish discoloration of the sin. Not exactly the words of choice for someone trying to be the youngest president ever to seek office. Ike lied about the U-2 spy plane. One has to wonder why he didn't follow that old Washington advice, the wisdom of the ages sometimes cries out for silence. And FDR lied pretty regularly in the months before World War II about keeping the country out of the Great War, never send our boys to Europe, etc. History proves that uh, he was probably right. If there ever was a reasonable lie, that probably was it. But after LBJ, of course, came Richard Milhouse Nixon. I won't bore you with a bunch of self-serving anecdotes about Nixon's lies. Uh, Watergate pretty much speaks for itself. Forty people went to jail, including the Attorney General of the United States and a bunch of high White House officials. All of them lied when they plead, pleaded not guilty and then were convicted. Even the very best newspapers have never learned how to handle public figures lying with a straight face. No editor would dare to have printed this version of Nixon's first comment on Watergate, for instance. Quote, the Watergate break-in involved matters of nation, national security, President Nixon told a national TV audience last night, and for that reason, he would be unable to comment on the bizarre burglary, period, paragraph. That is a lie. We don't dare do that. But that is what it was, and for better or for worse, we aided and abetted in publishing something that wasn't the truth, something that was a lie, and it was us who was lying. I hate to hedge this bet by calling them anything else than lies. Even the boldest editorial pages where such a comment might be appropriate are reluctant to strike that hard that fast. But people have always asked me, about what was it like, you know, really, Watergate, blah, blah, blah. 400 stories, and the thing that I remember most of the time, and I couldn't put my finger on it, but there, was, there came a time early on that we really knew that the people in the White House were lying. We couldn't prove it, but we knew it, we felt it, and these were people who had, uh, whose gut feelings were very reliable. So we have to wait and search aggressively for ways to prove that lie. And in the process, we alienate those who don't believe or don't want to believe the lie. Other presidents after Nixon, Jerry Ford was not around long enough to lie significantly. <laughs> he did, uh, once he did, there is a picture in the, uh, in the conference, news conference room of Jerry Ford, it's an absolutely wonderful picture of him. Uh, it was an illustration on an NBC uh, feature, and it's uh, him smiling and pointing, and there's a little thing coming out of his head saying, I got my job through the Washington Post. <laughs> of course, he didn't say that, but he did, he did uh, send it to us uh, to say uh, to my friends at the Washington Post uh, uh, something I've even forgotten what he said, but uh, th this is for you, and uh, it's not all that wrong, or something like that. <laughs> Jimmy Carter, who told us he would never lie to us, pretty much kept his word, I think, at least until he ran into trouble uh, the, over the U.S. prisoners being uh, released by Iran as the, uh, as the guard was changing. Ronald Reagan, perhaps because he was a professional actor, was an accomplished liar as well as a very good president, it seems to me, as I grow older. My favorite Reagan lie was his claim that during World War II, he had served as a Signal Corps photographer 
who had filmed the horrors of the Nazi death camps. Reagan first told this lie to Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir during a White House meeting in November 1983. The roots for his concern for Israel, he said, could be traced to the time he photographed Nazi death camps as a Signal Corps photographer. Afterwards, he said he had saved a copy of the death camp films for himself because he believed that the day would come when people would no longer believe that six million Jews had been eliminated. Years later, when a member of Reagan's family asked him if the Holocaust had actually occurred, he showed them the film, he said, according to an article in the Israeli newspaper Ma'ariv, known to be close to Shamir. The accuracy of the Ma'ariv story was confirmed some days later by Dan Meridor, who was secretary to the Israeli cabinet. He repeated this lie in February 84 to Nazi hunter Simon Wiesenthal and Rabbi Marvin Heyer, according to both Wiesenthal and Heyer, both known for their fluency in English and their attention to detail. When we tried to check this story with the White House, we were told that, by Jim Baker that the president told him he never left the country in World War II and never told anyone that he did. Boom, stonewall. My two personal favorite Reagan lies were quite simple. Mount St. Helens erupting caused more pollution in the atmosphere from all the cars in the world had ever caused since cars were invented. <laughs> Perhaps confusing carbon dioxide with carbon monoxide. <laughs> and he often told how the end of segregation occurred in the armed forces of the United States. Segregation ended, he used to say, when a black sailor in the U.S. Navy picked up a machine gun during the bombing of Pearl Harbor and started blasting Japanese bombers out of the sky, forgetting that it was President Truman who ended segregation in the armed services in July of 1948, five, a few years after Pearl Harbor. Except for Iran-Contra, where Bush consistently stated that he was out of the loop, which most experts that I trust agree was not true, was not an easy liar. A few exaggerations that slipped into the definition of lying, perhaps, but uh, like the fact that Clarence Thomas is black and a minority has nothing to do with this sense that he is the best qualified Supreme Court candidate at this time. No one in, the United, in America believed that statement to be true then or now. 